Hey Siri, call MJ. Hey David. Hey, good morning, Teresa. Hey MJ, I'm in now. Come on back. It's, it's been so long, David. I know. What what's a couple like a couple hours is just too long, okay? <laughs> So you're going to come onto the screen here? Okay, so we get Keep coming. Okay. You're, you're not there yet. Right. Hello. Hi, Virginia. Hello there. Hi, David. I just sent you an email you can ignore. Got it. Hi. Got it. Hi, Ron. This is Alan. Hi, Virginia. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ter Therese. Whoever's with, is that, what? I don't think I've, we've met before your name. Alan so. Painters. Alan. Oh, hey, good to meet you, Alan. By, I know the name, of course. Hi, David. It's Bert. Oh, hey, Bert. Nice to see you or, or hear you. Hear me. Yeah, hearing me. Not much to look at these days. That's what a colleague used to always say about me. He said I had a face made for radio. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and Bob Edwards. Very cute. Well, that, and I said fine. That's, that's okay famous. company, Bob Edwards. <laughs> I don't know who Bob Edwards is, okay? So really? From me? NPR? Really? Yeah. Are you yeah. too young? He's too young, obviously. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Hi, Bert. <laughs> Hi there. Hi there. Hello, everybody. We're, we have two Berts on the call, David. We have we have a Bert Green and a Bert Greenwood. You talk about confusing right there with uh, <laughs> I'm sending emails right there. Hi, partner. Hey, MJ. How are There's you? There's MJ. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Good morning. All right, who's on the iPhone here? I don't okay, know. I don't have a name on that. this one. Because then we're looking in this direction. Well, I'm on my iPhone, but do you have my name, right? No. No, it, no, it just says Bert. I mean, uh, iPhone. But you oh, know well, what? It could probably me. I can rename it because I'm the host. <laughs> there you go. Call me, what, call me whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Let's try this. But we need to know a name, whatever you want. <laughs> it's Bert Green. <laughs> Judith, nice to see you. Hey, David, as the host, do you want to rename one of us? Because now you've got Bert Bert. <laughs> can't, you can rename yourself Bert Greenwood. I, ca I can? <laughs> yeah, yes. go up to your little blue dots, your dots. Oh, okay. So I should, I should rename myself. Okay. So everybody, you can rename yourself. So if you so wish by clicking on the three dots. I did not know that. Okay. <laughs> Where are the three? Oh, up there. We're just going to hang on here for a minute. Uh, anybody seen Ron? I don't see Ron anywhere. <laughs> is that the way it was in Michigan too, Virginia? And uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> he was always first. Where's Ron? <laughs> Where's our leader? No. So the one good you... news about being, I, I live downtown. I'm about five blocks from Westlake, and Alan just saw. Uh, volunteers at Westlake this morning cleaning up graffiti. Yeah. 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 Yep. So possibly yeah. after this call, we're going to go up there and clean. That's great. That's great. That, uh, um, that email from Common Purpose today, David, was um, really, really what I needed. From Ch I mean, I got it from Charles, but right. it was coming from Common Purpose. Anyway, it was a really good email. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Yeah. I'm going to see if Ron is like trying to email me or something. <laughs> Do you like it at this point? I thought it was fine. It has to whistle. I didn't get an email this morning. Oh, there it is. Charles, difficult to Why don't you text her? I'm just going to text Ron here. Hmm. But we're going to get going. So let me see here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and record because I know a number of people have asked to see this. It, it looks like it's already recording. I got it. You are correct, people. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for coming on here to chance to talk about Michigan, our work in Michigan and common purpose, or in CP. Um, and uh, I'm joined by uh, my colleague and co-host on this, MJ Jimenez. Um, Y'all know MJ. Mm -hmm. And our goal here is, um, well, first of all, our goal is to be in community, okay? That's our goal here is to be together um, and to find strength and connection each other with each other in this work in these tough days. Um, and we are committed to this work of voting justice and there will be no lack of commitment and there'll be no retreat on any of that. Um, but there are definitely days where it's harder and these are some of them. So thanks for coming together for this chance to talk a little bit about our work in Michigan, uh, what we've done over the last couple of years and how there's an arc to the importance of this work over time. And um, why it's important to do work at time one because things begin to happen at time two and time three that couldn't happen without the work at the beginning. Um, so we're gonna, I'm recording this, it'll be put up on our, our CP, um, uh, YouTube page. I will also take the audio of this and put it on my on the podcast that we run, the With CP podcast. Um, so let's just do a quick around the Zoom room, real quick, just introduction of where you are at right now. Um, so MJ, you want to start us, please? Sure. I am in my room. <laughs> I'm in my room. You can see my bed in the back there. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Sure. Virginia and Jeff? We're in my home office. I spent a lot of time here lately. Northeast Seattle. Awesome. Therese and Alan? We are in um, my downtown condo, five blocks south of Westlake, um, in my sitting at the dining room table looking at my living room. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Judith. I'm in uh, South Seattle and sitting in my studio um, where I'm spending lots of time. Um, and I may have to leave before it's over. So just so you know, it's not because it, uh, it just it's a heads up if I disappear. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Peggy, please. Oh, I'm in West Seattle, already isolated by the bridge. But um, I'm in a condo where one of the gates didn't close last night, and one of my neighbors got very anxious, and so she felt sealed in. And I guess this whole time to me is just reminiscent of much earlier, similar, uh, you know, times in our history. Sure. Thank you. Let's uh, let's just kind of have a, a, a everybody go on mute unless you're going to be talking. So everybody hop on mute. Um, Paul, please. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm in my music room in my house in the Central District. And Susan Peterson, my wife, will join us after a little while. Great, thanks. Connie, please. Uh, I'm home, uh, my house on Mercer Island, uh, looking out at the rain, hoping to get outside. Thanks, Connie. Glad to have you here. Melina, please. Hi, I'm in my kitchen in Woodenville. 
Okay, great. Bert, uh, Bert Green. Hi, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yep. I'm in my kitchen uh, in Seattle looking at the rain. I just took my doc dog for a walk in the rain and saw four ducks in the middle of the street. Okay. Chill <laughs> chilling. We'll take that. We'll take that. We'll take that, yeah. Sure. Terry? Hi there. I joined to hear something. Po I'm muted. Oh, something uh, positive. And I'm in my kitchen in Ballard about to make breakfast. Awesome. Thank you. Bert Greenwood. Hi, I'm in my bedroom in Magnolia. Hmm. Thanks, Bert. Faye? Uh, hi, uh, I'm in my dining room in Magnolia, in Seattle, in Magnolia neighborhood. Great. Thanks, Faye. Lorraine? I'm in my living room in Bitter Lake. Mm. Thank you so much. Okay, I got uh, two folks who I don't know their name. So this phone number right here, 206-694. Uh, yeah, 206-947-4560. I don't have a name there. Who's that? This is Joan DeClaire. Okay, hey Joan, where are you this morning? I am in Marble Mount, Washington. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us, thank you. And then a phone number is 206-283-4937. Who's that? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. This is Nan McKay and I am in Magnolia. Right. Thanks, Nan. All right. So, Ron, uh, just a second. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna send a quick email to Ron. How's that? There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I'm on it. On the computer and on my phone. How's that? Outstanding. So, hey, uh, uh, thanks for joining us, Ron. Ron, where are you right now? I'm in my family room, uh, sitting on a little uh, window seat. Okay, all right. So the goal on these uh, conversations, these CP impact conversations, is to, is to have a conversation where people chime in. Uh, we're going to start with the folks who've been part of the Michigan team, and then MJ and I will just ask some follow-up questions, and then we'll open it up for other questions, okay? Um, it's a chance to learn about our work, to celebrate our work, to also draw strength going forward in our work. Um, so, Ron, I'm going to start with you and then with Virginia and Jeff. So, Ron, uh, in like in a minute in a, or a minute and a half to two minutes, why Michigan politically? Why Michigan personally? Michigan politically because it, in 2016, was the closest presidential race of any state in the country. Trump won by uh, a tenth of a percent of the vote, around 11,000 votes. So it's a really important swing state in the presidential contest. It is a state that has been gerrymandered by the Republican legislature. So even though the Democrats as a whole get as many votes as the Republicans at the time had um, nine out of uh, 14 congressional seats uh, back in 2016. And so going there to work on uh, an anti-gerrymandering initiative, which I think we're gonna talk about, a pro-democracy initiative, to work for a couple uh, competitive house seats, and then you know eventually we gotta get that back on the right side for the presidential race. So it's, it's the swinginess of swing states. And for me personally, I grew up there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, went to college there, still have a lot of friends. Uh, Trump went to Grand Rapids, Michigan, the last day of the campaign and was there actually on election day with one of his uh, neo-Nazi rallies. So I wanted to you know, bring my people back to the right side. Jeff and Virginia, how come you signed on to Michigan to be part of that work in 2018? 
Well, we signed on to the work of common purpose initially, and we're willing to go where, wherever worked. And uh, as it happened in 2016, we, we were, uh, 2018, we were uh, in the area around the time. So it worked for us to go there. And then we kind of got a real um, uh, affection for Michigan. So we went back again in the fall. So we've been to Michigan twice in 2018. And I think Ron summed it up pretty well. We really were enthusiastic about the pro-democracy and the voting initiatives. And we were so impressed with the candidate, Alyssa Slotkin. She met with us, she's so authentic, she's so smart. And so we're working now to make sure that she goes back uh, to Congress again. And of course, uh, the Trump administration is working really hard to have her not go back. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that we have the right person in the White House uh, in 2021. Yeah, and, and Gretchen Whitmer, governor, obviously that woman, right? Um, and uh, and uh, Gary Peters, uh, U.S. Senator, uh, the James, the guy that ran Republican, who happens to be black, uh, ran two years ago for the other Senate seat, didn't get, didn't get it. And then uh, he's back again. So, but trying to defend the incumbents. So there's there's a lot of critical races in Michigan. You look at the number of absentee absentee ballots that were uh, uh, turned in in the uh, in the uh, the presidential preference primary there a bit ago, and that came from one of the initiatives that we worked on that that passed the the uh, democracy initiative, one of the 10 provisions, and that, that made a huge difference in that state as compared to the, the crap that happened next door in Wisconsin just a little bit later. Okay, awesome, thanks. I'm gonna pop up a, a map of the state of Michigan here. Can everybody see that? Yeah. So Ron, can you tell us where you went? Help us to think about, help us to think about this to start with geographically. You're muted. The first trip we did in uh, May of 18 was to uh, Lansing in East Lansing, because that actually is the Western edge of Elisa Slotkin's district. And um, that's when we did, you know, the work of uh, gathering signatures, you know, for the pro-democracy initiative and uh, actually met with the voter, not politicians people um, uh, on the steps of the uh, Capitol building there in Lansing. And then the rest of the work, a uh, second trip in the spring and then this trip in the fall, we're in Oakland County, which is uh, suburban Detroit. And that's the, Eastern edge of Elisa Slotkin's district. So it was in the cities of Rochester and Rochester Hills. So when, when you went there in 2018, um, in, if I believe correct, was it in spring or in the summer the first time? It was in the spring the first time. Okay. And uh, Virginia and Jeff, you were both part of that trip, right? Yes, we were. Both times. Yep. Okay. So what happened, what was that like in terms of going on that trip? Cause that was one of the very first trips for CP at all. Okay. So we were totally making it up uh, as we go. So you can be honest about, about how well, we were making it up. Uh, I want to say that the, for me, the best thing about that trip was understanding uh, how much I enjoyed canvassing. Uh, initially the idea of canvassing just scared the heck out of me. Uh, but uh, it's so well organized and the people that we're talking to are, are leaning toward us anyway. So um, most people were really welcoming and it was just, it was just really interesting to talk to people face to face. Um, and uh, we, as it happened, we did a, a, we shared an Airbnb with a bunch of folks. So we got to have dinners together and kind of debrief after every day, which was terrific for us because it was very personal and, uh, we felt like we were making a difference. Part I liked the best was the gathering signatures. Um, you can always get one more and one more and one more. And that was midday right near the state capitol. Uh, we were fortunate enough besides being collecting signatures for the Voters Not Politicians Initiative. We also were in with the uh, 
with the, uh, help me out, the, the pro-democracy. Well, that was pro-democracy, but the, the other one, uh, help me out, Ron, let's see. We were in, actually at the celebration when they were turning in the signatures for the other the one. The voters, not politicians. Voters, not politicians. Okay. Um, at the at the state house. Yeah. Wow. So I have a question for either Ron or, you know, Virginia or Jeff. Ron and actually Jeff and Virginia were on, are on my Florida team. Um, so I claim them too. Uh, but actually, um, they're great canvassers. Um, and uh, what was it like, what were the sentiments that you were like, what, was, what were the, the feelings that people were giving you? Did it feel like those people had been, you know, because you, you said, Ron, I'm not sure if this is right or not, but you were in a little bit of rural areas in Michigan, is that correct? That was the second one. That was, that was in the, in the, in the, right, in the fall. Yeah. First oh, time okay. in the city. But when, right. when you were there the first time, what were people telling you? Did they feel like they had been able to connect with folks before? Were there people going to their homes um, before you came to them? Or uh, did it feel like they were very grateful that you were there um, talking to them? Because I know from our experience in Florida, I know that I had experiences where people were very grateful because they had never been talked, spoken to. That was the second time in the fall. Well, actually, the first time we were in Michigan, we did a little bit of canvassing to find out how people were feeling about the Voters Not Politicians initiative. It's a kind of, kind of early uh, intelligence there. And uh, one of the things that we asked people is whether they'd heard about it, whether they were aware of it. And it was interesting because I think the grassroots organization did a pretty good job of getting the word out. And, and most people were really happy to talk about it and uh, very welcoming of us as canvassers. I think in Michigan, I don't recall ever having a door shut in my face. I do. Maybe once or twice, <laughs> but very, Just very that I do. <laughs> well, we all you know, have different scary, experiences. He's scarier looking than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I would add in the fall, um, you know, then the campaign was a little bit more engaged. I mean, people uh, on both sides. So I did hit uh, particularly some older white guys that were not that happy to talk about Elisa Slotkin. So, you know, you get a mix, but in general, you uh, have positive experiences when you're interact with people, uh, when you're there on the pro-democracy kind of initiatives, uh, people were pretty lined up for that because they understood it was their vote we were talking about, either in terms of making it easier to vote on the pro-democracy initiative, promote the vote, or the other one, the anti-gerrymandering one. Uh, mm -hmm. And they both passed, you know, with flying colors uh, on, on election day. Yeah, I wanna, I, wanna un, I wanna kind of like separately talk about each of these things that you worked on. So this is part of what made Michigan so awesome in 2018 and is paying so many important, I don't think the word quite, quite the right word is dividends. That's where I was gonna go, but that's not quite the right word. It's justice is paying out in terms of voting justice right now. So let's talk about, there's three groups. There's voters, not politicians, this grassroots organization. There's promote the vote, which I believe is also a grassroots organization. And then there was the Slotkin slash Michigan. And those folks really were three different entities, right? And so, so let's start, let's start first with Voters Not Politicians, this organization that was the focus of the Slay the Dragon video that we've watched and was really fighting against gerrymandering. Let's just separate them and talk about them. It sounds like they came chronologically first for us too. So let's just chat about our interactions with them and how we got connected to them. Any one of you three, please. Well, why don't I start because, you know, I, uh, we didn't want to go to Michigan because that's where I'm from. So I started doing research and I found out about this initiative, started uh, learning about it. The uh, woman that got it started, who was prominent in Slaying the Dragon video, uh, Katie Fahey, was from my hometown. So that kind of, you know, uh, warmed me up to the whole thing. And then I got, I met with, uh, you know, through the year of 2018, I met probably six different of the volunteers in Grand Rapids, in Lansing, in Oakland. And they were all uh, nonpartisan, but hugely capable. I mean, they were the most organized group uh, we worked with, um, uh, you know, in that year, for sure. 
I, you know, we always had the sense that they were um, grateful to have us working with them. And uh, they were right there providing the materials that we needed and uh, made it pretty easy for us to, to help them. The, the, uh, the signature collection we did for that was all in downtown uh, Lansing, right near the Capitol during the lunchtime for like three hours a day, which is just cranking hard to get nail those signatures. We got a bunch. So. And on that one, the promote the vote, uh, we were working with uh, Jessica Ayub from I'll promote the vote. Yeah, he's right. Uh, Jessica Ayub from the ACLU. That was being sponsored by uh, ACLU, League of Women Voters, NAACP you know, several other, so they were more, uh, not quite as, you know, citizen driven as much as organizationally driven. But um, one of the interesting things with that was, you know, we would talk to people in Lansing who were state employees. And I had several people tell me, hey, our boss has told us if we sign this, we're going to be fired. So I can't sign it. Which wasn't right. true. Wasn't I mean, true. That gives I you mean, a sense. it should not have been true. Right, it should not have been true. Right. Right. So they they were like distinctly nonpartisan all the way. Like they, right. they wanted nothing to do with like a partisan smell, right? Particularly yeah. uh, voters, not politicians. Yeah. I can yeah. guarantee people I worked with were Republicans. Oh really? Yeah. Hmm. Let me I'm gonna show the trailer for voters not politicians right now. Uh, the uh, Slay the Dragon trailer, which was, um, which captures their energy a little bit. As important as 2008 was, 2010 was to be a more important election. 2010 is a census year, and we redistrict every state and congressional seat following the census. You win state legislature in 2010, you get to draw the new maps that control all the elections over the next decade. The winner is pre-decided just by the way that the districts are drawn. <laughs> Under the scenario of the Democrats winning the vote by the biggest margin they've ever won in modern Wisconsin history, the Republicans have still get 59 seats minimum. That's an astonishing manipulation of democracy. Congress will never fix this problem because they have one interest on them, this is to stay in power. It's the biggest heist in modern American political history. I'm Katie Fahey. I'm with an organization called Voters Not Politicians. We started from a Facebook post. I saw that there was a pent up energy. So I just thought I'd, yeah, try. <laughs> First there was 10,000, then there was 20,000, and this thing just sparked. We're working with the anti gerrymandering drive. They're absolutely worried about us. They know that once this gets on the ballot, it almost always passes. <laughs> This is going to be the battlefield moving forward. If they lose, it's no holds barred. There will be a vicious fight by the people who are in power. We are seeing efforts to undermine the very core values of American democracy. This may be the last time we have an opportunity to do something about partisan gerrymandering. The people of our country are sick of this, and if we don't come and say that enough is enough and nothing's going to change. I reached out to voters, not politicians, and chatted with their communications folks. They just weren't able to get someone to join us today, but they, they are, you know, express their deep appreciation for our work and for our contributions to them. And also, I express our incredible respect and appreciation for them. Um, post 2018, because I want to take this from then to now, the, uh, there have been a series of challenges to the, to the initiative that passed in the state. Um, the, uh, the, the anti-gerrymandering initiative, which implements a, a panel of, uh, puts into place a, a commission of 13 people, citizens commission of 13 people that would draw the, uh, the districting maps. 
um, has been challenged by a series of folks, including Scott Walker, the former governor of Wisconsin. Um, but that, those, those challenges have been struck down and it's going forward. Is that correct, Ron? Uh, yes, although the opponents of the initiative have now asked for uh, reconsideration by the uh, district, uh, the uh, appellate court, federal appellate court, uh, and they want to en blanc, you know, they want the whole group to consider it because it was upheld when it first came up to the U.S. Uh, uh, appellate court. So there's an ongoing legal fight. I mean, it, it's uh, kind of last gasped, I'd say, on the part of the opponents, but um, they don't give up and they got the money to, you know, pay for the lawyers, so. Hey, MJ, like, in terms of, like, an honest question here, have you, had you thought or heard or know much about the idea of gerrymandering, like, more than a, a year and a half ago? What'd you know? No, honestly, I feel like, and I said this before, in all honesty, before coming on to being part of Common Purpose, um, I only cared and only really uh, understood and um, about election year for presidential um, years. And I, until coming to Common Purpose, uh, and before I had an experience being a manager, a campaign manager in SeaTac, and it was really until then that I realized how important it is to win other seats, other in, um, smaller races, um, municipal, you know, governor seats. Um, and it wasn't until I came to Common Purpose that I started really learning a lot more about the, the gerrymandering that's going on in the whole country, how voters are suppressed, um, how even, you know, especially you know, my community, the Latinx community is oppressed and uh, vote suppressed um, and their voting rights. And um, that's something that I really did learn when I came on to this team and to the, to the community. Um, and especially with that incredible film that I just watched, um, Slay the Dragon, it was really such an eye opener for me. Um, I knew about gerrymandering, but I didn't know exactly how it's really actually done, like the actual ways that, that it's done and how districts are divided to make sure that there's more on this and less on that side so that votes you know, don't get us to the seats that we want. And so that's, that's definitely something I didn't really know about, but I'm happy that I do now. And that I'm happy that I'm working here with everyone, all of you all um, to, to fight against that. Sure. So let's talk about promote the vote then. Had you, had you uh, connected with them before you arrived on the ground in Michigan? Unmute. In fact, we tried first with the League of Women Voters, uh, didn't get through to them, but I did get through uh, to the ACLU, and, and they were great. They gave us training, we got there, had all the materials we needed, clipboards, etc. So they were uh, a great and steady partner uh, on that effort. And then we worked with them again in, uh, in Oakland County in the fall. And the thing that was so great about them was they took the time with us to really explain that initiative because it was not a simple one. There were like 10, ten different um, components ten. Ten. that would make it, that would make voting more accessible. And I, I just remember this so well. Um, I talked to one woman on the street and she said, I'm not signing that. I don't think it should be easy to vote. Oh. Wow. Which I thought was really interesting. I have a question about that, actually. It's interesting because as we talk about gerrymandering, I'm wondering, are the, were the, the demographic that, was it, was it mostly, um, was it mostly white folks you're talking to or was the demographic, you know, was it, did you talk to any people of color while you were there um, that, you know, those are the people that are mostly the ones who are affected by gerrymandering there suppressed. I'm wondering if, if those are the people that we're talking to and hoping that they understand how they can vote. We talked to some uh, people of color. Michigan uh, is predominantly white, I believe. Well, so uh, where we were in Oakland County. In Oakland County, they weren't yeah. always, yeah. But, um, well, no, we were over by Lansing, that's right. Oh, no. Uh, we we talked to a variety of folks, and um, the thing I think about gerrymandering is it's it, it often targets people of color, but it also targets 
uh, socioeconomic uh, groups. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, and it goes a long way to making sure that Democrats and Republicans are um, uh, distributed in, in a way that it will keep, at this point in Michigan, keep the power with Republicans. You know, and I think we have to be honest that Democrats have used gerrymandering as well. It's not, it's not exactly. like it's a, a, a re, a just a Republican problem. They're a lot better at it, though. <laughs> sure, thanks. I want to. Ron, Ron, did I get that right? You're still mute. You're on mute again. You're still mute. Can't hear you. I'm trying to unmute. There, there we go. There we of go. course, they're hurting me. They don't want to hear my voice. <laughs> the, no, I, on the whole issue of uh, people of color, I did talk to people in uh, Lansing, in particular, and uh, there were people that just felt that that why why sign up on this pro-democracy, make it easier to vote thing, because it's uh, your vote doesn't matter. And you know, several of them, you know, you convince. Uh, my best argument was you don't want people like me being the only ones deciding things. <laughs> That's a good argument. <laughs> um, this is the promote the vote folks, uh, which had a whole suite, as you were referencing Virginia, a whole suite of things that they were, that they were trying to get passed. Um, and this is their thank you now after the passage of this. But I want to scroll down here. This was their rationale. And here's the bullet points of the things that they were working on. Um, protect the right to a secret ballot. Not exactly sure what that is about, but ensure that military service members and overseas voters get their ballots in time. Provide voters with the option to vote straight ticket party, which is a, which is a kind of debated thing. Um, often in states, Republicans don't want to allow that because they feel that uh, they can split the ticket easier. Automatically register citizens to vote in the Secretary of State's office. Obviously, that's automatic voter registration, which we now have in our state. Um, we had uh, allow a citizen to register to vote anytime with proof of residency. And then here's a huge one. Provide all registered voters access to an absentee ballot for any reason. And you know, I think it's part of my journey with Common Purpose and in this work that I heard about that and knew about that as part of Promote the Vote in 2018, but it, had, it did not register with me how meaningful that was, how important that was at that time. And now I totally get it in the COVID well, world. And I think the other thing to be aware of there is um, it's, I, I, start to refer to that as mail as mailed ballots because the idea behind an absentee ballot is that you should only be able to get an absentee ballot if you can't go to the poll but why should you have that restriction you should be able to mail in a ballot regardless of whether of where you are on election day like president trump sure yeah, in the state of Washington, we have one, we put one adjective in front of what you just said, uh, Virginia, which is we have universal mail yep. ballot, right? Yep. If you're a registered voter, you get a universal, you get a mailed ballot to your, your home. Absentee simply allows you to have mail ballot if you so choose, right? Right. So like Ron Utah, we're obviously, they're all Democrats. Oh, wait, they're all Republicans. There you go. What? Jeff is always here, everybody. If you don't know Jeff yet, Jeff is always here to, to kind of like dig the knife in just a little bit. It's <laughs> okay. Well, no, it's my rebuttal to the R's that talk all this bullshit about it's only Democrats. Christ, Utah is a totally vote by mail state. And well, and Florida and Arizona, these states have been high, high mail vote states. Therese, we're going to answer your question in a second here, just so you know. Okay. So, uh, I want to ask uh, about this. Well, today we now have absentee balloting in, in Michigan. No excuse absentee balloting because of that exact initiative, because of that. So this is the first year that we have the ability of Michiganders. That is the correct, correct reference to multiple Michigan folks, Michiganders, okay? Um, 
I'm from Michigan. So, you know, Ron and I have this like the secret connection, uh, although he's from the Western part of the state. Let's just say that. Okay. <laughs> and I'm from Detroit, the heartbeat of the state, that area. All right. Okay. Um, but they can now get out, they can get these mail ballots. Uh, and this ability to vote by mail then requires one more step. You got to get the ballot. You have to get the ballot. You have the right to it now, according to that law in 2018, but you have to get the ballot nonetheless. And here's where part of common purposes work further comes in. As we were doing our work in fall, really fall of 2018 to support the candidates, we helped to elect one particular person, a, a, secret, a, whole, a whole suite of Democrats, but one of whom Jocelyn Benson, who's now the secretary of state and has put into place the plan to mail absentee ballot requests to all registered voters in the state. So, Ron, can you talk a little bit about the fall? Let's talk a little bit about the fall work, the the get out the vote work, and how it is that Common Purpose works up and down the ballot. And David, you're going to have to unmute mute him, I think. Yeah, we got it. Thanks. You got it. Okay. So uh, the work we did in the fall was, again, on those two initiatives, you know, we were doing doorbelling for them, but predominantly, predominantly in the fall of 18, we were knocking doors for uh, Elisa Slotkin. And that work it was, you know, all doorbelling. Uh, and it was in areas that were, uh, you know, they were traditionally lean Republican. So, you know, they'd sent us to doors that they thought they uh, might have a chance with. Um, and it was an interesting mix of people that we saw. We did do some rural areas where you'd have to walk, you know, two tenths of a mile down a dirt uh, alley to get to the person's house. So we, we had a, a good range of experiences, I'd say. Um, and you know, it was in that particular election when we were there, uh, Slotkin was behind in the polling. Mm. Uh, she was getting hit by a TV ad that uh, used Senator McCain, criticizing her at a confirmation hearing. And one of the things I'll never forget is when, um, in a kind of an appreciation, she brought us out to her farm for uh, a meet and greet. And she was, um, real pleasant, you know, why are you here, da 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 da. And then at some point she said, look, I love doorbelling and I haven't been able to do it now. I got to do, you know, phone calls or campaign kind of view TV, whatnot. So I haven't been able to talk directly with those. Tell me, what are they saying? And she is former CIA and you could tell she was doing an interrogation at that point. She wanted to suck that information right out of your brain. So uh, that's part of what I got from her is she can listen intently. Judy and Jeff, were you there for that? Oh, it was a, it was just a huge highlight. I was so impressed with her. She just radiates this, um, intelligence and dedication to our country. That is so impressive. Well, she ended up as the leader of the first term Congress people, Congress women, pushing Pelosi to file the articles of impeachment. I mean, she was the, she was the point person. And if you listen on NPR and whatever, the R's went after her and have big time there. She has five Republican opponents for the primary that's happening in a, in a bit in Michigan. Hey, David, is it, do you think it's a good idea right now? Some people are asking questions on the chat. I wanted to see if you'd like me to read them out. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, MJ. All right. So the first question is from Therese, and she's asking uh, if the redrawing, she's asking if the, the redrawing of the districts will happen after November. Um, and if so, are we, so are we stuck with the current district boundaries? Yes, we are stuck with the current district boundaries. All right. It's after the census. Mm, okay. and, and interestingly, I don't remember, for example, Ron, maybe you do, what the margin was that Alyssa Slotkin won by, but it was, it was pretty substantial. Do you remember what it was, Ron? Uh, yeah, it wasn't that. Sub so she was behind in the initial vote count and ended up winning by around 3%. Yeah. And it was until the vote from East Lansing came in, yeah. it actually carried the day. 
Yeah, and the scary part is, are the students going to be there this November? We don't know. Mm. Right. So, do we think that we that that we could elect Biden in Wisconsin with these horribly gerrymandered districts um, and the Electoral College? So, in in. Uh in like a state like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, all of those states have been gerrymandered by Republicans. There are states that Rep uh, Democrats have consistently won a majority of the popular vote um, in congressional races, in statewide legislative races, but yet don't have control and then don't really have even that close of control of the state legislature. We have a chance in Michigan to flip what the, we have a chance in the House, isn't it? We are in both, Ron, this year. Um, well, there's a chance to get another seat in Grand Rapids because Justin Amash, you know, is running there. Uh, and that'll split the vote three ways in Grand Rapids. Um, so at the legislative, state legislative and, and con House congressional levels, we are fighting to get that ungerrymandered. And after the uh, 2010, uh, 2020 census, those districts will be re re redrawn. And in Michigan, they'll, they'll be fair, more fairly drawn. They will. They will also be more fairly drawn in Pennsylvania, where the courts actually did ungerrymander prior to 2018. That's helped us to win a couple elections there. In Wisconsin, the battle is stronger, although we now have a Democratic governor, Tony Evers, who gets to have a say in the, in the district drawing. All of those, though, are separate from the Electoral College from the president. So the Electoral College votes are completely driven by the popular vote in the state, completely. Oh. Okay, so so in Michigan, Ron is con is committed to to winning at least ten thousand more votes, right, Ron? <laughs> yes, and yeah, we got to get at least that. I don't know if we're going to do it only on our own, but yes, we got to get another ten thousand votes there on the presidential side. And, and on that, let me just say, I mean, there's uh, some synergy between these races. You know, when you work for an Elisa Slotkin. And she targets like educated suburban women to make sure she gets every one of those she can. You know, once you can get someone to vote for a Democrat for Congress, it's a lot easier than for them to vote for a Democrat for the U.S. Senate, a Democrat for Biden. You know, there's that kind of cognitive dissonance you have to break through if you vote a Republican all your life. I think I finally got my mother turned on this issue. So, you know, we, we have... Uh, uh, when you work for one person uh, like a Slotkin, you're really working for Joe Biden as well. Yeah, um, please bring in your questions in the chat. I know you might have another one, MJ. Yeah, there's another one that says, well, kind of kind of going back to that, is how are, uh, how are Alyssa's chances for re-election? Uh, you know, she's in a district that is gerrymandered to be Republican. And like Jeff said, you know, without, if there's not that uh, Michigan State vote for her from the campus, it's going to be, you know, a competitive thing. I mean, she's been a hugely successful Congresswoman in her first term. So, you know, that'll help. And, uh, but it is going to be definitely one of the toss up uh, congressional districts in the whole country. So, I have a question. So, how are we? So how, what is Common Purpose and the Michigan team going to do about all this? <laughs> like, how are we going to get Alyssa reelected? That's right. What are you, you going to do about this, okay? Well, I, I could take that if you want. So uh, one of the things we're doing remotely now is uh, postcards, you know, ur urging people to vote for uh, Slotkin. Uh, as of today, we're up to 1,356 postcards, you know, mailed in. So that's a thing. Uh, we're also working with their campaign on phone banking to get people to uh, sign up for absentee voting. And uh, they would ask you to call people they think will be Democratic. So, you know, that helps again up and down the ticket. And then we're hoping to go back and door knock again. You know, uh, I've been tracking almost every day the conditions in Oakland County. And they're actually seeing, you know, a really sharp drop in uh, new cases of COVID. 
So, you know, we may be able to travel there in July and definitely in September if that trend continues. Hmm. Okay. I know we're hoping to go back in September. Right. September 27th. Yeah, it's on the calendar right now, right? Yep, our calendar. I want to say two things, kind of, and we'll bring it into the last kind of phase of this discussion, maybe another 10 or 15 minutes. One is that um, whatever you think of all of the different Democratic potential candidates or nominees for the presidency, it, it is absolutely clear to me and was from the beginning that the strongest Midwestern candidate was Joe Biden, okay? that Joe Biden would be the strongest presidential candidate in the Midwest. Um, his small town working class roots, his white, his white maleness, um, his kind of uh, uh, history of, of kind of connecting through empathy with people. And the Midwest is a, is a region that's been hit hard by economic change. So Biden has a great chance to win in Michigan and Pennsylvania and in Wisconsin, but also in Ohio and Iowa, all right? He's got a great chance. Um, so we, we will do all we can to support uh, Biden in that space. Uh, and then second, we're going to announce this on Friday. So today's Sunday, but on Friday, we will be taking this, the phone banking that Ron and other Michigander, Michigander teams, Michigander team members have been doing. And we're going to make that uh, CPY. So we're going to take that and make that available to everybody to do as part of our work. Um, and uh, Slotkin is one of our top people we want to work on behalf of, but I would think over time we're going to expand that Michigan phone banking as well. Uh, Haley Stevens, who's in the Michigan 8, and also a candidate who's running against um, uh, Fred Upton, in a, who's a longtime Republican in one district and won fairly narrowly in 2018. And then there's a couple statewide Supreme Court elections as well that are very important in Michigan. So I expect this over time to kind of like be calling wider. It might always be targeted for one particular candidate, but as Ron and other, as you all know that when you work on behalf of one democratic candidate to get out the vote, we're working on behalf of them all if it's a statewide race. There's also a statewide Senate race this time with Gary Peters running against John James who lost the governor's race to Gretchen Whitmer in 2018. Um, so let's see, what else we got here, MJ? Other things? No, I think that that was the last question earlier. Okay. All right. Um, if you, elders, you got questions, please ch put it, pop them in the chat. So let me uh, kind of go back a little bit to the dynamics of, of doing work for on the ground in Michigan. What, why do, why Ron, why Virginia, why Jeff, why MJ? but I could ask it to several others on this call too, but why, why do we in common purpose land on the ground and do work in these other states? Why not just do it here in Washington state? Because we want to win the presidency. Because our, our state is already pretty privileged, I believe. Yeah, I, I just felt like it was so much more productive to go to a swing state where we could potentially make a real difference. Whereas if we do, I mean, when we came back from Michigan, uh, we did uh, do some, I did some canvassing for Kim Schreier uh, because that seemed like a place where one could make a difference. But uh, I think it's, it, it, it's the, comes from the heart of my patriotism that I care about this country. And I think it is essential that we uh, get Trump out of the White House. I, I just, we, we can't have another four years with him. And uh, uh, that's going to remain my political focus until uh, after this election. Mm. And I just add that, you know, doorbelling itself, that face to face contact with people, you know, I think in political science has been proven to be one of the most effective things. So my fingers are crossed that we still get to do that. And uh, uh, Lisa Slotkin is huge on that. She thinks that's how you win, is by uh, she and her volunteers actually talking to people face to face. Yeah, and you know, as a, as a, for me, I think the, my journey in Common Purpose and just as a, as a person who lives in this country, who um, is a 
brown young person. Um, it's been really interesting to knock on doors and the different things that I've heard and the different, um, but I think that the most rewarding things that I've had, that I've experienced is going to a home where, where the people living in that household have never been approached and have felt that they were not, or their voices are not important. Their, their voices are not, that have been unheard. Um, and I think that, that has been, in my experience going to Florida, that has been the most rewarding part of all this, um, knowing that I was able to touch somebody and to make sure that they know that their voice does matter. And now in the work that I'm doing to outreach to the Latinx community across the country, um, I've, I've been feeling a lot of privilege because I'm able to do that work. Um, I'm able to connect with my community from home, you know, doing calls or whatever, but to Florida, um, to Arizona. And so I've, I've had the, the honor and the privilege to do that work. Um, and I think it's, it's, really, it's really our job as this generation. Uh, millennials are really, they really need to push more to, to connect with those communities and to be involved, so. And I guess the other uh, really important point to make is we can't sit on the sidelines. We have to be involved. And I think it's really important to do the calculus of what's the most effective way to be involved. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I really appreciate the work that we have done in Michigan and all of the states. We had 12 states in 2018. Um, six, states, seven states uh, in different ways in 2019. And then we are committed to 20 states uh, in, in varying ways for 2020. Um, and every once in a while, we, we think, well, we should add South Carolina as well. And that would be like a 2021, uh, a 21st state because of Lindsey Graham and the desire to defeat him there. Um, so maybe 21 states, I don't know. But we can do this work remotely. We can do it. Uh, it takes a different kind of energy to do it remotely. A travel brings a certain kind of uh, commitment. You put it on the calendar, you, you know when you're going, all of that. And I, I, we get that that's a different reality than, hey, we need to make calls now to get absentee ballots because the absentee ballots that they get now, they can use in November. Um, but this is what we can do. And for some Americans, what they can do is, is – show up and protest around these police killings that are horrible. For some Americans, it's a chance they give money to support candidates and campaigns. Um, for some of us, it's all of these things. For some, and for us in Common Purpose, it's absolutely to fight for voter registration and voter mobilization in these, in these key states, um, our own as well as these others. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep doing that we're going to expand those opportunities this year to everybody. We really see the past 10 days as an inflection moment, a moment in which this election uh, became very concrete to millions and millions and millions of Americans in a new way. Um, and that really from essentially labored uh, Memorial Day on, uh, this is it. We are in the, the, the home the intensity of it. We're in the last five months of this election now. Five months until we get a decision in this country. So every day is election day for us. So thank you all so much for being part of this. Uh, Ron, for your work in Michigan, meeting Jeff and Virginia and Paul, and I, I know you were there and maybe some more of you were also there. Funny. So thank you all so much. Uh, let's go forward. Let's do this work. And let's let's try to stay strong in our community here as we go through these tough days. All right. Well, let's put up our hands and put them to the high five. High five. <laughs> go team. Thanks, go David. Team. Go team. Yep. See you later. Thanks, Bye. Thanks David. Thanks.